Thank you for the introduction. So I'm Damien Octo, I'm at Google. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about some work that I did when I was a research associate at the University of Wisconsin and Penn State. This is joint work with Samesh Jha from the University of Wisconsin, Matt Dering and Patrick McDaniel from, the, from Penn State, Alexandre Bartel from Technical University of Darmstadt, as well as Lily, Jacques Klein, and Yves Letran from the University of Luxembourg. Android applications are programmed in components. And essentially a component is just a set of classes. These components can communicate with each other, both within single applications and between different applications. For example, an example of component, a typical component in Android applications is called an activity. And an activity is just a user screen. Now, this inter-component communication that occurs in Android applications allows developers to share data and to reuse functionality from other components and even from other applications. I'm just gonna show you a simple example. Let's say that you have this application, which is a restaurant finder application. It allows users to find restaurants according to specific criteria. It has two components. One of them is a search component which allows the user to look for a specific place. And the other one is another component that gives a detailed view of a specific place. Now let's say that our user wants to find, say, a Chinese restaurant in St. Petersburg. So she inputs into the search component, find Chinese restaurant in St. Petersburg. The search component returns some results. So the user is looking at the list of results. And there's one of the, the results in that list that she likes. So she actually clicks on it. What happens is that this starts the details view component and it gives details about this particular restaurant. Now what happens under the hood, behind the scenes, is that when the user clicked on the search component, this component sent a message to the details view component. In Android, these messages are called intents. Now let's say that our user is looking at this, uh, the details of this particular restaurant, and she likes what she's seeing, so she wants to figure out how to get there. So there's another button that she clicks on, and again, what happens is that this component sends an intent message out to the Android operating system, and the OS takes care of delivering it to an application that can handle this type of message. The application, for example, could be Google Maps. Now, this is a powerful mechanism for at least two reasons. For developers, it's nice because it allows developers to reuse the functionality from other applications. The developer can just rely on the fact that the operating system knows how to deliver this type of message. In a traditional development model, the developer would either uh, implement their own rendering engine or they would uh, just integrate some dependency that would be able to uh, render maps. For the user, from the user's point of view, it's actually nice because it allows the user to choose which application should perform a specific piece of functionality. Now, there are some drawbacks to this uh, mode of communication, which is that this intent message may be intercepted by some uh, potentially malicious applications if the user or the developer are not uh, careful. Uh, looking in more detail at this detailed view component. So an intent is just a Java object. So when the developer wants to use that intent, he just uh, basically starts by instantiating it. Then it, the developer sets the fields of the intent in a way that describes the functionality that should be achieved. So the action of the intent is set to view, which is a very common uh, type of uh, action uh, value. And then the data is set to be a URI with a geo scheme. Finally, the call to start activity in the last line lets the operating system know that this intent should be delivered to a component or to an application that can handle this type of message. Now, this a mode of addressing is called an implicit intent in that uh, we specify the functionality that should be achieved. There is also another mode of addressing which is called explicit intent. And in the case of explicit intent, the developer names the target component. So the developer would name the target application and the target class. If components want to be able to receive this type of message, they have to subscribe to it. And in, to do so, they declare intent filters. Intent filters are declared in the manifest file that comes with every single Android application. 
And basically, an intent filter describes the values of the fields of the intents that the component is willing to receive. So here, in particular, you can see this view action, this geo data, and then the default category at the bottom is actually something that's added automatically by the operating system. Now, given you know, what, what I said about this, you know, these communication mechanisms, you can imagine that we actually want to figure out how these components communicate with each other. And there is actually ex existing work that infers the values of these inter-component communication uh, values. For example, given the code that I showed you earlier, this existing work can find all the possible values of the intent variable at the call to start activity. Now the problem is that we're talking about static analysis here. So as you know, you can't always infer you know, the possible values of, uh, of, a of all the variables you know, in all the programs. There are cases where you have to make some over approximations and you get some imprecisions. The problem with these imprecisions in intents is that if you try to resolve some imprecise intent to its potential targets, then you have an explosion of the, number, of the number of potential links. And that's because you know you have to remain conservative. This is a, you know, particularly a, a problem at large scales. And so the goal of the work that I'm presenting today is twofold. First, we want to be able to find all the intercomponent communication links in a large set of applications. Once we have this, uh, num all these links, all these ITC links, we want to be able to actually prioritize them. Just to give you an idea, when we started doing tests at the level of a single device, the number of links that we got was you know, around a million. The order of magnitude was around a million. Of course, many of these links are actually false positives, but we want a way to be able to sift through them. Now, the first thing that we did, as I said, is modeling these uh, links. So the model that we came up with is using set constraints. So we see, we view intents and intent filters as uh, tuples of sets. And that's because you know, these, the fields of these, uh, of these classes are actually either sets or uh, singletons. And then the links themselves are viewed as constraints on sets. For example, this is, uh, you will recognize our restaurant finder application and the maps application. In this case, the intent is viewed as a tuple of these fields. So the first set is the action field, second set is the category field, and the last one is the data field. On the other hand, the intent filter is uh, defined in a similar manner. And using this formalism, a link is seen as this set of constraints. So basically, the action of the intent has to be included in the action of the intent filter. The, action, the category of the intent has to be included in the category of the intent filter, and so on. And since this constraint, this system of constraints is verified, you actually have a link uh, between these two applications. Now, the problem is that, as I said before, in some cases, uh, you can't infer the value of the intents the values of the intents in a precise manner. And so sometimes, for example here, you cannot infer that the, field, uh, the data field is geo. Instead, you assume that it's, it could be any string. So it gives you this regular expression that says, you know, that matches basically any string. Our formalism also addresses regular expressions. Now in order to resolve uh, the intents to the respective filters in, for large application sets, well, you know, if you had to come up with a naive algorithm, what you would do is you would consider all the intents and all the filters and you would see if they match with each other. That would give you an algorithm that runs in a big O of, you know, the number of intents times the number of filters, and that's actually the worst case and also the average case complexity. Now we came up with an algorithm that has better average case uh, running time, average, yes, average case running time, and it consists in basically resolving all the targets of each of the intent fields and then intersecting the resulting sets. The average running time uh, is a big O of E min times the number of, of intents, where E min is the minimum expected number of targets across all of the intent fields. And that's actually a lot uh, smaller than the number of intents. And again, this algorithm addresses the case of regular expressions. 
Now, once we have all these links, we have actually a lot of, a lot of these links. So what we want to do now is to be able to prioritize them. So the idea for the prioritization of these links is that we want to estimate the likelihood with which they are actually true positives. And so our system performs this ranking. It's called Primo. And so we have our static analysis results. And on top of them, we overlay a probabilistic model that is trained using our corpus, our application corpus. And then we define this PIF quantity, which is the probability that the link between an intent I and an intent filter F is a true positive. The model is domain specific. Uh, we could have used you know, some machine learning techniques or, or things like that, but we wanted a model that is easy to tweak and easy to, to interpret, and also that scales well. Now, using some, uh, some assumptions, we, for implicit intents, this PIF values, value is actually expressed as a function of the known fields. And so looking especially at the second line here, this is actually... Uh, given as a function of the precise field. So this is actually using the uh, assumption that uh, the uh, patterns that are used for implicit intents are very commonly used. For example, I showed you a pattern where you have the view action and the geo uh, data field. That is the pattern that is always used when you want to display a map that is centered on some given coordinates. We can ex uh, estimate these uh, probability values using empirical probabilities. Basically, we have statistical data about the prevalence of certain given intent patterns. Now, just to come back to our example, re remember we had this restaurant finder application, and it matches this uh, maps application with probability PIF1. On the same device, there might be another application, for example, this is a spy application, potentially, that handles uh, a, lot of, a lot more actions, a lot more geo, uh, a lot more uh, data fields, like geo and tel. And we want to be able to estimate, say, PIF1. PIF2 is calculated in a very similar manner. So the probability that the first link is a true positive in our formalism is the probability that the data field of the intent is compatible with geo. Given that, the inferred value of the action field is view, and the inferred value of the category field is default. And as I said, we have actually some empirical data about the prevalence of these uh, patterns. So for example, using some uh, hypothetical empirical data, it could be that in 25% of the cases, whenever you have a view action and a default category, you have also a, a geo data field. Once we have these probability values, we can rank the links in decreasing order of probability. Note that I talked about uh, explicit intent earlier on. Uh, the model is a bit different. It, it uses some uh, slightly different insights uh, than the implicit intents. So we evaluated our approach uh, by computing all links in 11,000 over 11,000 applications. And the, these are the highlights of our evaluation. I'll come back to these in more detail in the next few slides. The resolution yielded 636 million links. And we were able to perform this computation in 30 minutes. We evaluated our model using careful cross-validation. And we actually showed high rank correlation with our, the ground truth. Finally. Looking at the distribution of the probability values, we found that over 95% of the links had actually a very low probability value and are therefore, therefore uh, likely false, false positives. So first, as I said, we computed the links uh, for over 11,000 applications. We retargeted the applications to Java using our DARE tool, and we computed the ICC values using static analysis with a tool called IC3. The intent resolution uh, took into account over half a million intent values and over 100,000 uh, components. And we had almost 100,000 intent filters. The entire resolution procedure took 30 minutes only. 
we got 636 million ICC links. And looking at the distribution of these links, we found that only 6% of intents contribute to 80% of the links. And so this really um, is something that confirms the insight that I gave you at the beginning of the talk, which is that whenever you have some imprecision in some intent field, because you're doing a conservative uh, intent resolution process, you have an explosion of the links. It's not that you know, everything matches everything, it's just that in some cases, some intents just match a very large number of intent filters. We performed also the evaluation of our probabilistic model itself. And so what we did there is that we took these intent values for which we actually know all the fields, which is actually a vast majority of intent values. We introduced imprecision in these uh, known values in a controlled manner. So the, uh, the distribution of the imprecision that we introduced actually reflects the distribution of imprecision that we are seeing in real world data. We performed the, our, all of our algorithms, you know, the matching and the uh, probability computation using these uh, imprecise values and we compared them with the ground truth. So we know the ground truth, remember, for these uh, particular intents because originally they were actually precise intents. We introduced the imprecisions ourselves. We compared the rank, the ranking that we uh, got for the imprecise value with our ground truth and we measured rank correlation using Goodman, Goodman Kruskal's gamma statistic. We got a rank correlation that is over 97%, which is very high. Um, you know, 100% means co perfect correlation. Now the reason why this is very high is that our model tends to assign probability values of zero. And it is actually right to do so because there are many, many false positives. However, it is also a limitation in the case of unseen data. As I said before, these uh, probability values are assigned using some statistical data about you know, the prevalence of specific uh, intent patterns. It's not very good in the case of application specific values. In some cases, there are some field values that are only used in a single application. In this case, our model is actually not good at handling these, uh, this unseen data. However, in a large majority of cases, the fields are actually used across many different applications. In fact, uh, if we look at only the action field, uh, the top five action field values were actually found in 67% of the intent values. So in a large majority of cases, we have these common fields. Also, values with close empirical frequencies uh, could um, entail some inversion of the ranks. In our model, our model is not you know, precise enough that you know, it makes a big difference whether uh, something has probability 0.2 or 0.25. So there, there could be some inversion there. Finally, the distribution of the probability values is given by this graph. Note that the y-axis is actually log scale. So n over 95% of the probability values that we inferred are under 0 0.01. And so these are actually likely false positives. If you were to not consider these values in your client analysis, you would lose some soundness, but you would very likely not lose much information. Looking at the distribution of these particular links which with low probability values, a lot of them are actually related to uh, in explicit inter-application links, which uh, are, I mean, in themselves, they are actually very likely to be, they, they correspond to the insight that we have of uh, intercomponent communication that there should be false positives. And so our ranking is useful for resource allocation. So in summary, we uh, developed a model of intent links using set constraints. Uh, and using this formalism, we de devised a fast resolution algorithm. We uh, also came up with a probabilistic model of links that is useful for ranking the probability values of obtained using static analysis. In future work, we think that you know, there is a lot of room to refine the model. In particular, we could use some smoothing to better handle uh, unseen data. Also, we could relax some of the assumptions that we've made to also, again gain some precision. And finally, we could also add more features other than you know, the fields of these intents and intent filters 
to try to get also, again, something that is more precise. Our implementation is available online and open source, so please do try it out and uh, give us some feedback. And uh, with that, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. So great talk. My name is Veselin Reichen from ETH Zurich. Uh, I'm interested, so you showed some example, a concrete example on maps and geo and inferring that maybe it's geo if the other fields are true. But you said this is somehow hypothetical. So did you actually have some findings really for Android applications where the static analysis loses precision and your model helps? Yes, we, so we have actually a more detailed discussion of this. Um, the data field uh, is actually more, uh, it's actually harder to infer. Um, just because they are, infer they are uh, specified as URIs in Android, and these URIs have, there are actually many ways that they can be generated, and uh, basically you, you have different string operations that can be performed and so on, which are, are things that are typically uh, harder to infer in a static manner. But so why, why your approach would be successful for data fields? So if, if there is only one receiver of kind of view for view and something, then the set constraints would resolve it anyway. Why, why would I need the correlation tracking? So I, I'm not sure I... Uh... So if you show, if you go to your example with the geo. Right. I don't know, where was it? Maybe next. Yeah, so I have this view would match geo, but if I have only one receiver of view, then I don't need the precise data to be inferred to be geo in order to match the receiver of view. So you, like a hypothetical receiver? If I have, have intent, intent receiver of view, and there is only one intent receiver of view that is geo as well, I don't oh. need to infer that this is geo. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. So yes, I mean, but this is, you're talking about a case that is simpler than you know, the general case that we're handling here, right? Mm -hmm. the, I mean, you're talking about correlations between different fields. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're talking about? Like if, whenever you have one field, you always have the other field. Um, yeah, in, you're finding this right. So in practice, I think our model is actually a lot more uh, precise than this because you know, it gives you precise statistical data about, about you know, the, this type of things. This is something that our approach would, uh, would infer. You know, it would say, well, the probability whenever you have a geo of having view is always one or you know, the inverse. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Wei Yang from UIUC. So I see that uh, for interval component uh, communication, there could be different uses in different categories of app. So if I build probabilistic model based on different categories of app, or like diff build different probabilistic model for benign app versus uh, malicious app, 